Hello, my name is Derek Miner. Today, Melody Reynolds and I, who are counseling graduate students at the University of Central Oklahoma, will be discussing enuresis and its treatment. I'll be presenting part one. This includes discussing what enuresis is, prevalence rates, quality of life issues, and causes. In part two, Melody will be discussing cognitive behavioral treatment for enuresis. First of all, there are three types of enuresis. The first type is nocturnal only. This occurs when urine is passed during nighttime sleep unintentionally. The second type is diurnal only. This occurs when urine is passed during the daytime unintentionally. And then there is nocturnal and diurnal, a combination of the two subtypes, which means a child does not have bladder control during the day or the night. Nocturnal only subtype is considered the most common subtype. 85% of enuresis cases are nocturnal. Sometimes this is referred to as monosymptomatic enuresis. Nocturnal enuresis occurs most frequently during the first third of nighttime sleep. So if your child sleeps 12 hours, it can be expected they will wet the bed within the first four hours. Diurnal only subtype. This subtype is used when nocturnal enuresis is not present. Sometimes this is referred to as urinary incontinence. Urge incontinence occurs when there is a sudden urge of symptoms and the child doesn't have time to reach a restroom. This can be a problem when the child is, is at school, at recess, at a grocery store, and they get a sudden urge, and the urge is so strong they are unable to make it to a restroom and therefore they wet themselves. Voiding postponement occurs when urination is consciously deferred until incontinence occurs. This occurs when a child is out playing, say on recess, or doing any type of activity, and they feel the need to urinate, but they choose not to, and they continue to play and do whatever else is holding their attention, while their bladder gets fuller and fuller and they delay longer and longer. What happens finally? The child, uh, the child wets themselves. This is called voiding postponement. Children on average attain daytime control of urination at two and a half years old and nighttime control within a year after that. Therefore, a child should be expected to gain nighttime and daytime control of urination by the age of three and a half years old. Diagnosis of enuresis can only occur once the child has reached five years old. Before five years old, bedwetting is an expected occurrence. Pre prevalence rates are much higher for younger children and much lower for older children. For instance, for five-year-olds, the prevalence rate is 5% to 10% that they will have enuresis. For 10 years old, the prevalence of enuresis is 3% to 5%. For 15-year-olds, the prevalence is around 1%. Therefore, as you can see, with age, enuresis does become less of a problem. Only 15% of those diagnosed with enuresis will outgrow the problem within a year. This means that treatment is, is a necessary component when it comes to eliminating enuresis. Without, uh, without treatment, appropriate treatment, the child will less likely be able to, to overcome this problem on their own. Currently in the United States, there are 7 to 10 million children affected. 90% of those with enuresis have actually no medical problems. This is purely a, a psychological or behavioral problem. Boys are more likely to meet diagnostic criteria for nocturnal enuresis. Girls are more likely to meet diagnostic criteria for diurnal enuresis. Children are more likely to develop a form of enuresis if their fathers met criteria. This is also true if both their mothers and fathers met criteria. These children have a much higher likely chance of developing enuresis when they are young. So there are many quality of life problems associated with enuresis for both the child and the, and the parents. For the child, there is a restriction in social activities. Um, a child may, may not feel like they can go to a, a friend's house to spend the night because they're afraid they're going to wet the bed. Or they have trouble uh, wetting the bed, wetting, wetting themselves when they are out playing at recess. Um, this can result in embarrassment and diminished confidence as they 
will likely be the target of uh, bullies and they might just be made fun of for wetting themselves. Uh, parents also have a problem with getting enough sleep. For instance, they may have to wake up once, twice, sometimes three times a night to change sheets and, and change the clothing of their child because the child uh, continuously wets the bed. So getting this problem treated is, is not only beneficial for the child, but very beneficial for the parents as well. So what are the causes of enuresis? Um, first of all, there could be a lack of an antidiuretic hormone at night. This um, antidiuretic hormone it enters the body while sleeping and it is used to prevent uh, bladder function. It helps, it helps the, the child or the adult uh, maintain, maintain a sleeping state without having to constantly wake up to go urinate. There could also be a developmental delay in bladder capacity. If a, a child has an abnormally small bladder, the likelihood of making it through the night um, without wetting the bed is much smaller than a child who has a bigger bladder. They can hold more liquid. Also, there can be a delay in the development of active avoidance responses. An active avoidance response is a response made that avoids a situation from occurring, like wetting the bed. If the, when a child is sleeping, if the child will, will contract the pelvic floor muscles, and the external sphincter of the bladder neck, they will be able to pre prevent urine from flowing out of the body. This is an active avoidance response because it prevents urination. Waking is also an active avoidance response. If the bladder is full, the child will wake up and go use the restroom. Therefore, they don't wet the bed. Another cause of enuresis is when the child fails to learn from adversive stimuli. For instance, a wet bed would, would be an adversive stimulus because the child is laying in liquid all night long. And another adversive stimuli would be sleeping in wet clothes or wet underwear. If a child doesn't see these, these situations as adversive, they are unlikely to learn from those situations, which will help them prevent um, enuresis or wetting the bed. There are co-occurring disorders with enuresis. There can be both developmental and psychological delays. Um, urinary tract infections are also common. Incopresis, involuntary defecation, sleepwalking, and sleep terror disorder may all co-occur. So what is the goal of treatment? Well, first of all, is to teach the child to respond quickly and appropriately to a full bladder. This means when they feel the need to use the restroom, they use it. Or they learn what it feels like to, to have a full bladder while sleeping, and they learn to prevent urination by contracting those muscles and waking up to go use the restroom. Also, we want to change the signal to the brain from one of urination to one of inhibition and wakefulness. By doing this, the child will begin to wake up when they have a full bladder instead of laying in bed and just sleeping through it and then wetting themselves. Part one is now finished. Now Melody will discuss cognitive behavioral treatment for enuresis. Thank you. Melody and as Derek mentioned before um, I am also a graduate student at the University of Central Oklahoma in the discipline for psychology and I'm going to talk about the cognitive behavioral aspects of treatment for enuresis and this includes several components um, there for one is a contract that we will be implementing between the parent and the child there is uh, a component called cleanliness training, uh, self-control training, and then there is a basic ear and learn treatment, and then an overlearning component as well. And we'll talk about each of these things in detail. So all of the components combined are what we call the full spectrum home training, or FSHT. And this can be uh, done at home. Usually it is done at home because, um, because it's going to be implemented when the child is sleeping, and typically they're sleeping at home. So we'll talk about the urine alarm first. What the urine alarm does is to create an active avoidance response um, for urination by startling the child while they're sleeping. So what happens when this, um, when this occurs is the, the pelvic floor muscles contract when the child is startled and prevents them from urinating in their bed or it will wake them up so they can use the toilet. Um, 
if the psychological response is made, the child avoids wetting the bed, therefore increasing dry night. So we call this negative reinforcement. Um, negative because we're removing the stimuli of the wet bed. So how the urine alarm works is it's a little battery operated component. There are two pieces to it that are attached by a cord. One um, is fastened on the outside of the, the child's pajamas about here and it's an actual alarm. The other piece is um, goes underneath the child's underwear and it senses moisture. So as soon as the sensor picks up any moisture, the alarm is going to sound off, waking up the child. So this is important because um, the child is learning to associate the wetness or the sensation of urination with the alarm. So, or in other words, they're waking up at the same time as the sensation of urine is occurring. So the urine alarm treatment, with, with the alarm treatment component, the pelvic floor activity that occurs when a child either arouses to or sleeps through the sensation of a full bladder is, con is a conditioned response that is initiated by startling the child with an alarm. So a conditioned response is something that occurs every day for all people um, and it it relies on an external cue from our environment that initiates a response in us. So an example of this would be if your phone rings, you've been conditioned to answer it just because it rang. Even we do this without thinking about it, it happens automatically. Um, a child with enuresis has not learned to wake up when they have the sensation of, um, with the sensation of needing to urinate. So using the alarm teaches them to wake up at the exact moment. You could also call it a learned response when the two stimuli are paired together. So the alarm is useful for conditioning the response that we were wanting from the child. So another component of the FSHT training is called cleanliness training. And what this entails is um, it, basically the child being responsible for their own um, actions, being independent and in cleaning themselves when, when they do have an accident. Um, specifically the child is to turn off the alarm when it sounds, so this is not something that a parent should be doing for the child. If the child is sleeping through the alarm, parent needs to come in, come into their room, wake them up, and, um, but not turn off the alarm for them. The child needs to wake up and turn the alarm off themselves. Uh, the child is also responsible for changing any wet sheets and for resetting the alarm after all of this has occurred. So they'll wake up, they'll turn off the alarm, they'll change their sheets, they'll reset the alarm, they'll go back to bed. So a parent needs to make sure that the their clean sheets, clean clothes for the child to access so that they can take care of their responsibilities. So another component of, uh, of the treatment is called retention control training. This is done during the day when the child's awake, when the child's not sleeping. And what happens is the parent will give the child eight ounces of water at a specific time during the day that the child and the parent have agreed upon. And the child will come to the parent and say, hey, I need to go to the bathroom. The parent at that point will start a timer and say, okay, let's hold it for three minutes. And after three minutes, the child will use the restroom. After the child has met their goal of three minutes on the first day, they will increase the time by three minutes every day. So the next day they'll hold it for six minutes, the next day it will be nine minutes, and so on until they reach 45 minutes. Um, when the child, when and if the child meets their goal, they should be reinforced. So reinforced, um, reinforcement should happen immediately when they um, achieve the behavior that we're looking for. So in this case it should be holding, the yarn, holding their yarn for three minutes. And reinforcement should include maybe stickers or money, um, something that's valuable to the child. 
and it should occur immediately upon the desired behavior. So also a parent should be keeping records if they met their goal the first day. We want to record that. We want to record how long they held it and continue this every day of the retention control training. And the child should be congratulated if they do meet their goal. If they do not meet the goal, we're not going to um, punish them for it. We're going to still be encouraging but not reinforce them if they have not met the goal. It's very important to reinforce only when they've met the goal. So to prevent relapse in the first year, we're going to implement the overlearning process. And this is something we're going to start um, after the child has reached 14 consecutive dry nights with the urine alarm. So we'll implement the urine alarm first. We'll wait till they've achieved the 14 consecutive dry nights, and then we'll go into the overlearning process. And what overlearning is, is to give a child 16 ounces of water immediately before bed. Um, by implementing this process, we can decrease our relapse from 40% to 20% in the first year. The modified version of overlearning is recommended and will actually cut your relapse rate from 20% to less than 10% in the first year. And so the modified version um, involves giving the child five ounces of water to start with and then gradually increasing it by two ounces every night until they reached another consecutive um, 14 nights, dry nights. So for instance, if you have a five-year-old child, um, you will give that child five ounces of water and the next night you will give the child seven ounces of water. And depending on the child's age, you don't want to exceed ever the child's age plus two ounces. So for a five-year-old child, seven ounces will be the max. And you'll continue to give them the seven ounces every night until you've reached the 14 consecutive dry nights. First, come up with a contract between the parent and the child. And this contract is going to involve um, an agreement between the parent and the child stating what their responsibilities are. So for the child, this is going to uh, include turning on and off the alarm themselves, changing their own sheets and their clothing, and for the parent, that's going to involve supplying clean sheets and clothing. Um, everything we talked about in the cleanliness training will be uh, specifically laid out in the parent-child contract. Additionally, there's going to be specific timelines for when the child goes to bed, when the child wakes up. Um, good sleep hygiene is very important in this training process. Um, children who do not have a good uh, sleep routine are not going to do well in this treatment. We need to rehearse this with the child. So during the day, we'll practice taking off sheets and making the bed. If you have a very young child, they may need some help making the child making the bed, but the responsibility should definitely be on on the child. Um, after we've figured out the cleanliness training, this is something that's going to happen every night while the child is wedding. Um, we're going to implement self-control training. This is which the component that's done in the daytime and involves holding their urine for three minutes increasing that every day. Once we've done that, we're going to implement the urine alarm for 12 weeks approximately. Every child will be different. Um, some children may take longer than 12 weeks. Some children may be able to achieve 14 consecutive dry nights before 12 weeks, but we need to commit to 12 weeks initially. Um, once we've reached 14 consecutive dry nights, we will implement the overlearning procedures that we've talked about um, until the child has reached an additional 14 consecutive dry nights. So the child-parent contract that we discussed earlier um, is going to include um, an agreement between the child and the parent which states specifically what their roles and duties are. Uh, initially, we need to uh, commit to 12 weeks and complete the training completely and as described. 
We're not ever going to punish, scold, or ridicule, say anything negative to the child about the treatment or to the child about their progress. Uh, the child should have an appropriate bedtime. The treatment is not going to be effective when a child is stressed or overtired. There should be no restrictions on liquids. And it's very important to be supportive of your child to not complain about the procedures. And as we discussed, reinforcement is a huge part of this training, so um, giving them that reward when they've met their goals is, is going to be very beneficial and necessary to have successful in this treatment. Uh, the child agrees to the cleanliness training procedure, so placing the wet sheets in a specified place, putting their wet underwear in a specified place, um, the parent agrees to provide clean clothes and clean sheets for the child. The parent agrees to wake immediately when the alarm rings. Must be able to hear the alarm and wake if the child does not wake up. Um, again, parents should wake the child if they do not wake up, but they should not turn off the alarm for the child. That is the child's responsibility. Uh, the child and the parent both agree to the overlearning procedures once we've reached the 14 consecutive dry nights. And do not worry about occasional bedwetting, especially if your child is sick or stressed. And also tell your child not to worry about those occasional um, bed, bedwetting. So some common mistakes that a lot of parents will make is to leave out parts of the treatment. Um, that is not going to be effective. We need to do all components of the treatment. If you leave anything out, we may not achieve dry nights and you're going to have a greater risk of relapse. Um, failure to wake the child. They're not going to learn um, the conditioned response of waking up when they need to urinate if they're not actually waking up during the night or with the alarm. Um, keep accurate records so that we know how long the child is holding uh, during the retention control training and reinforcing appropriately. Don't get discouraged. It, it does take quite a bit of commitment, quite a bit of time. 12 weeks is a, uh, a long time to commit to, but it is worth it in the end. Uh, don't quit too early. Quitting too early can cause relapse. So those are the basic components of uh, cognitive behavioral treatment for enuresis. Thanks for joining us and good luck.